we have done uh, for quite some time now what we call collinear collisions. A collinear collision is a collision where two objects collide with each other in one dimension. So in other words, both objects are on the x-axis or both objects are on the y-axis. Collisions like this, right? Car number one, a coming towards uh, maybe car number two that's at rest. Maybe they stick together, go off as one object. Maybe they bounce apart, whatever, it doesn't matter. We've also done these problems, collinear problems, where we've got, let's say, car number one going down this way, hitting stationary car number two. Or let's change it. Let's say car number two is coming down this way, hitting stationary car number one. They go off as one object. They go off as two objects. doesn't really matter. Both of these are what we call collinear collisions, collisions that we've dealt with so far uh, at, at nauseum or over the last week or so. In both cases, we're going to say PI is equal to PF. And in both cases, we're going to say, let's say they stick together. We're going to say M1V1I plus M2V2I equals MVF. In both cases, exactly the same. A quick question. Quick question. In this one over here on the left-hand side, this collinear collision that we've dealt with quite a lot, ladies, on the left-hand side here, how could we simplify this a little bit before we plug numbers in? We don't know any numbers here. We're not going to solve this problem. But how could we simplify it a little bit before we would plug numbers in if we had numbers here? Car number one is moving to the right. Car number two is stationary. This disappears, right? Because V2I is zero. On the right-hand side, this disappears because car number one is stationary. Agreed? All right. Well, what would you do then? What would you do? If you saw a problem, what looked like this? Car number one is moving to the right. Car number two is moving downwards. They collide right here. And then they bounce off. They stick together again. And then they bounce off as one object. By the way, where would you predict that the wreckage would go? If number one is going to the right, number two is going downwards, where would you predict the wreckage would go? Down and to the right? Okay, good prediction. That's exactly where it would go. Which angle? I'm not sure what angle it would be right now, but we know it would go down and to the right somewhere. How would we analyze that problem? How would we look at it? Well, what I want you to see today is that the way you would do this problem is no different than the way that you've done all the other problems to this point. What you see right here, we call this problem number one, call this problem number two, and call this problem number three. What we see in problem number three is really just problem number one and two combined. The way we're going to do this is break it up into what we call x components and y components. For the x component, we look at only horizontal motion. And for the y component, we look at only vertical motion. So let's look at the x component for a second. Car number one, we're going to say PI is equal to PF. Car number one is moving. M1, V1, I. Okay, car number one is moving on the x-axis. Car number two is not moving on the x-axis. It's moving, but it's moving on the y-axis. So because we're looking at only the x-axis, and it's only moving on the y-axis, we're going to cross out that term, just like we did in problem number one, where we didn't even have any y motion. The combined mass would be m, my momentum would be mvf. So for the y component, we go through the same process, pi is equal to pf, m1 v1i plus m2 v2i equals mvf. Now we're looking only at the vertical motion, right? Now we're only looking at the y component. So object number one has zero momentum. It's got zero velocity on the y-axis. It's only moving on the x-axis. Car number two is moving. Afterwards, they're moving on the y-axis. So if we go back to 
problem number one and two, flip between problem number one and two and problem number three, we see that it's exactly the same thing. If we look at this problem right here, where we have a non-collinear collision, one thing on the y-axis, one thing on the x-axis, if we pretend while looking at x-axis that there is no y-axis, then we have this problem. If we pretend while looking at the y-axis that there is no x-axis, then we have this problem. And we can do these two problems. Here we've done them a ton over the last week. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do this problem. Problem number one and problem number two just combined into one problem. Now, when you solve this, you're going to get a VF here. That VF will not be a final answer. You're going to get a VF for the X component. And you're going to get a VF for the Y component. What are you going to do with those? Now that we've done basically problem one and two combined in one question, what are we going to do with the answers? This goes back to physics 20, right? But four weeks in to physics 20. In fact, physics 20 today, for the first time, I'm going to begin and doing this in physics 20 today for the first time. Sorry? Yeah, almost, yeah. We've got an X component of our answer. We've got a Y component of our answer. How do you find your answer? It's not cosine, but it's Pythagorean theorem. Right? Whatever you get from X, whatever you get from Y, solve it using the Pythagorean theorem. And then we can find the angle using one of the trig functions, probably going to be tan function. Right? It's no harder. The good news is all of these problems that you get now are exactly the same as the prob problems you've done before. They're just combined. The bad news is each question that you see now is really like three questions in one. An X component, a Y component, and then the vector analysis to combine them. So it's more work. If you had 10 questions on a homework sheet last week, 10 questions on a homework sheet this week, well, this week it's the equivalent of 30 questions. But it's no harder. There's more work. So when we're analyzing a two-dimensional collision, what we call non-collinear, we've got to break it up into the x component and the y component. Separate. And then we've got to recombine them. That makes the question just like the questions we were doing last week, the collinear questions or the one-dimensional questions. When you're analyzing the x component, pretend the y is not even there. Don't worry about how much of it's going down or up. Just pretend it's not even there. If it's moving at 30 meters per second to the north, for the x component, pretend its velocity is 0, not 30. Similarly, when you're analyzing the y component, you're going to not ignore any x component. You're going to ignore any x component. So again, anything on the x-axis, pretend it's not there. Pretend it's zero. And then you're going to recombine them by drawing a right angle vector diagram, like you've done a million times in physics 20. And you do the Pythagorean theorem in trig. In the trig, we use it to be the tan function, usually. There may be exceptions to that, but 99 times out of 100, it will be the tan function. Okay, let's take a look at one fairly straightforward example of this, okay? We have a 90-kilogram quarterback running at 7 meters per second at 270 70 degrees. Not a big fan of this notation with the uh, direction here. We don't use that on diploma exams, okay? I'm going to show you that 270 degrees is this way, okay? If we look at an x-axis and a y-axis, this would be 0, this would be 90, this would be 180, this would be 270. So we've got a football player running this way. We'll call him player number one, 270 degrees. And we've got another person running this way, 
We'll call that person number two running at eight meters per second with a mass of 110 kilograms. And that's how I'm going to write down my givens in these problems. Draw a picture. It's a lot easier to write down your givens this way when you draw a picture than it is to write them down, just circle them or write them down separately. What's the velocity of the center of mass of these two players immediately after impact? In other words, the center of mass, we're going to pretend they stick together and they go off as one object. Player one and two go off somewhere down and to the right. Let's do x component and y component. There are two objects before the collision. There may be two objects after the collision as well, but since we're trying to find the velocity of the center of mass, we're assuming, we're pretending it's one object. M1, V1i. Tell me what V1, M1 is 90 kilograms, right? Tell me what V1i is. 7 or negative 7? Hmm. 7 or negative 7? Who says 7? Who says negative 7? Who says something else? I say something else. V1i is, Daniel, 0. Because we're looking at the x-axis, right? And 2 is 110 kilograms. V2i is 8 meters per second. It counts because it's on the x-axis. The combined mass is 200 kilograms times V2f. 110 times 8 would be 880. 880 divided by 200 would be 4.4. So Vf would be 4.4 meters per second. For the x-axis. For the x-axis. So we've just solved a problem basically like this. Car number two going towards a stationary car number one. They go off as one object. Okay, a simple, one-dimensional, stick-together problem. Okay, one of those problems that we did on the very first day of conservation momentum. We just pretended that object number one wasn't moving because we were only looking at the x-axis. Now, let's do the y-axis. Once again, PI equals PF. M1, V1I plus M2, V2I equals MVF. Hey, this time, let's take a vote. What's V1I? 7 or negative 7? Who says 7? Who says neg 7? Who says 0? Neg 7 wins. Okay? It's not 0 this time because we're looking at the y-axis. And it is negative because it's downwards. V2i, 8. Who says negative 8? Who says V2i is something else? What is it, Brea? 0, because we're looking at the y-axis. So let's cross off V2i and the m that goes with it. 90 times 7 is an egg 630. 630 divided by 200 is, I believe, 3.15. What do we do now? What do we do now? We've just solved two fairly easy problems. Tom, what do we do now? Right. Draw a right angle triangle, combine them. This is 4.4. This is 3.15 downwards. This is the speed we want. It's the square root of 4.4 squared plus 3.15 squared. In the angle, we need the angle because momentum is a vector. We need the direction or velocity, I should say, is a vector. We need the direction. It's going to be found by the inverse tan function of opposite over adjacent. Good. Tom? No, no, you don't need to do that, Tom. Um, that's a good question, though. Uh, Tom, if you didn't hear, guys said uh, for the degrees, wouldn't it be negative 3.15 when you plug it in there? Um, you don't need to do that. You need to show direction for velocity. This diagram shows me direction for the velocity already. 
Okay? So now, because I have my angle labeled right here, on the same diagram as the 3.15 is labeled, my direction here, 36 degrees, will be wherever it's labeled there. Okay? So I don't need to put the negative in there. All right? Guys, what I'd like you to do tonight is those questions that are already signed for homework and try one of these two. Try the first question just to see what you can do with that, okay? So 10 questions plus one, 11 questions for homework tonight. Have a good night, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow.